Okay, Paul, so here we are in March and uh, we've got the planets to look out for. So let's start as we normally do with the innermost planet, Mercury. Now, Mercury is in a poor position in the morning sky all month long because the ecliptic, the plane of the solar system effectively, has a really shallow angle with the eastern horizon at this time of year in the morning sky. Yes. Now, Mercury is... Well, it's, it's also quite close to Jupiter and Saturn. So there's a triple whammy there that Jupiter and Saturn are also going to be very poorly placed as well. Um, yes, it's... Can't win them all. No, it's, uh, Mercury it can often be low down and poorly placed. Uh, but uh, on the 5th of March, uh, it is uh, lies 19.5 arc minutes from uh, Jupiter, as you say. Uh, there is quite a notable difference in brightness. Mercury will be magnitude 0.2. Jupiter will be much brighter, magnitude minus 1.8 and as you said Saturn slightly fainter 0.9 magnitude uh, it's just 8.8 .8 degrees to the west so a nice nice uh, uh, combination of planets there but they will all be very low down and quite difficult to see this at this time of the year yeah and um, we're not going to do much better with Venus unfortunately no. because that reaches superior conjunction when it uh, lines up with the sun on the far side of its orbit on the 26th of March but that does mark a transition from it being a morning planet to an evening planet so there's a little bit of hope in there there is uh... but it's not it, it's not going to be as good an apparition as it was uh, during 2020 is it uh, no the the so as you say um the the after the 26th of march uh, venus will appear in the evening skies uh but it's it's not going to be a uh, as good an elongation as we had uh previously with venus really high in the sky but nonetheless it will be a, a nice observable target and it'll be nice to watch the phase decrease and see what phenomena we get uh, uh on the you know, the things like the uh the cloud changes and the cusp caps it'll be interesting to follow all that again and it will be nice to have it back but not quite as good as previously yeah okay well as far as the uk is concerned the planets are all of the planets unfortunately <laughs> are rather poor at the moment they are um and mars um is probably the only one which isn't hampered by its proximity to the sun in the sky um, however despite it being the most northerly planet at present which is quite an accolade the appearance of mars continues to deteriorate because it's unable to reach its highest position in the sky in darkness um, and at the beginning of march mars shines at mag plus 0.9 and presents a diminishing disc which is 6.4 arc seconds across when you look at it through the eyepiece of a telescope a um, bit disappointing that to be honest yes uh, by the end of the month it gets worse of course because Mars is moving away from us for now uh, it will have dimmed to magnitude 1.3 and through a telescope it shrinks to just 5.3 arc seconds so you will need at least a 12 inch telescope or larger I think to see convincingly any surface details so that, I guess that really marks the end of the apparition uh, it does for a telescope, but um, with the naked eye, um, there are still some nice things to look out for. At the beginning of March, it's located south of the Pleiades open cluster, lying 2.7 degrees from the cluster on the 4th of March. Now, it sits 7 degrees north of orange giant Aldebaran on the evening of the 19th of March, the date when Mars has its monthly visit from the Moon. And on that occasion, the Moon will be visible between Mars and Aldebaran, roughly one-third of the way along the line joining both objects starting from the planet. And the, Mar the Moon will appear as a 33% lit waxing crescent on that date, so a third illuminated. Um, so, that actually, that's quite a nice scene i remember popping out many years ago and um, i saw that with the moon i think it was venus at the time that mars will do and those two clusters together and took a very lovely photograph of that grouping so if it's clear it's worth getting out and having a go at that yeah as you say these little pairings of uh, various celestial objects which don't require any optical aid at all you can just go outside and look at them uh, are, are quite nice to uh, quite nice to, to to take part in uh but should note that this is really now the end of the mars apparition uh, and uh, Mars will enter a slow period where it will be too small for serious observation 
for quite a long time because the next opposition occurs on the 8th of December 2022. Mars will be quite good. It will be high in the sky. It'll be for UK skies, it'll be in Taurus. So that's quite high up for us. Uh, but About 60 degrees up, isn't it? It is. It is. So very good altitude, but unfortunately only 17 arc seconds across. So quite a bit smaller than, the, than what we had in 2020. Uh, but nonetheless, it will be nice to have it high in the sky. So we should look forward to that because this is, and that's not going to happen for a little while. Mars is going to be gone from our skies for a, for a little while now. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, we can sort of lump together because they're quite close to one another in the sky. We've already mentioned them, um, but they are in the morning sky, rising approximately 45 minutes before the sun at the start of the month. Um, but that low, shallow ecliptic angle will keep them very low down. So they will be quite tricky to see over that period. Now, heading further out in the solar system to the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, they're not particularly well placed either. Uh, Neptune is in solar conjunction on the 10th of March, so it's not visible. Um, and Uranus has its observing window closing very rapidly as the evening twilight comes up to meet it. So we're going to have to wait until later on in the year to catch up with those two planets. Yeah, uh, yes. It's a bit of a shame, isn't it? But um, yes, yes, but never mind. So they'll get better again eventually. <laughs> It's interesting, actually, that you get these periods where everything moves out of the way at the same time. So you're bereft of um, planets to look at, really, in the sky. But I suppose the saving grace, uh, if you like the solar system, is the fact that the, um, the ecliptic makes a very steep angle with the western horizon at this time of year, just after sunset. So if you have something like the, the crescent moon, um, hanging there in the evening sky that's well worth looking out for because it'll be in a very good position it's a good time of year to observe the moon and or the the early phases of the moon i should say and to enjoy a view of it through a telescope yes yeah, so we substitute our planets for the moon and that's not a bad swap because the moon has lots of detail that's easily visible in telescopes small telescopes and binoculars <laughs> Yeah, OK. Well, let's look at some of the specials on offer. We've already mentioned that uh, Mars is going to be very close to the Pleiades open cluster. Um, it's slowly making its way across the sky south of the Pleiades at the beginning of the month. Uh, closest approach will occur on the evenings of the 3rd and 4th of March. Um, so that's something well worth looking out for. And if you've got a camera, try and take a photograph of that meeting together. We get clear skies. On the 4th, we've got Vesta, which reaches opposition. And that'll be shining away at magnitude plus 5.9 in the constellation of Leo, which is pretty well placed. And in theory, if you've got a really dark sky, you should be able to see it with a naked eye. Yeah, it's quite difficult, though, unless you have got a very dark sky. Uh, I should mention that even through a telescope, you're not likely to see very much, of course. Uh, but it is worth looking for because it's a nice thing to be able to, to tick off the list to say you've observed it. Yes, OK, well, on the 14th, um, look low above the western horizon and here you should be able to spot a very thin waxing lunar crescent. The moon's setting approximately one hour after the sun. And as I mentioned earlier, the good angle the ecliptic makes makes thin moon spotting at this time of year quite, um, quite favourable. So that'll be worth, well worth looking out for. Yes, and on the 15th, the moon's libration state and phase favours observing features close to the northeastern limb of the moon. So here you'll find uh, the Mare Humboldtianum uh, together with craters like uh, Nansen, Hain and Boss. So it's worth looking out for these craters because uh, uh, these features because it's only when you get a favourable libration like this that they're easy to find and see. So I do quite like librational observations actually because they are quite challenging to make. Yeah, absolutely. And it should, it's also worth bearing in mind that on the 28th of March um, the full moon occurs close to lunar perigee at this, uh, at this particular time meaning that the moon will appear slightly brighter and fractionally larger than an average full moon and of course um, the usual furore will, <laughs> will arise around it being yes. a super moon yes um, but um, <laughs> Yeah, but in reality, it's not a huge amount of a difference in its appearance um, to a regular full moon. In fact, the um, the way it works, the 
the full moons either side of when you get the actual um, closest full moon to perigee, which I think happens next month. It's in April. It's about 12 hours away from perigee in April. Um, but the moons either side of that in, t in month time um, are very close to perigee as well. So the difference between those full moons and the actual perigee full moon for the year is so minimal that you wouldn't know unless no, somebody told you. That's right. And it was, it's, for all intents and purposes, there is no observational difference at all. Um, of course, on the 28th, we should remind everybody that the clocks go forward at 0100 UT by one hour uh, to 0200 BST. And this marks the official start of British summertime. Let's hope somebody notifies the weather. <laughs> Does it work on <laughs> clock time? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, let's head out then into the universe and look at the stars. Um, during March, the centre of the sun's disk appears to cross the celestial equator, um, the projection of the Earth's equator into the stars. Um, and on this occasion, as it crosses it, it's heading from the south to the north. And that marks what's known as the Northern Hemisphere's spring or vernal equinox. For those south of the equator, of course, it's the Southern Hemisphere's autumn equinox as the, um, as the sun is heading down for them. Now, it's often said that day and night are equal at the equinoxes, but that's actually an approximation. There are other factors which affect the length of night and day slightly for different latitudes. And the actual days when day and night are of equal length, if that's important to you, um, occur a few days adrift of the equinox. And they're known as equiluxes. Oh, you go, you see. It's, uh, it is often fun to tell that to people who think, uh, you know, that that's what equinox means. But no, uh, if only astronomy was that simple. It's never simple it's with that, anything, is it? <laughs> no, no, never. It's that time of year, though, where we find that the, you know, the really dominant, bold, brash constellations of, a, of winter, like Orion, they edge off to the west now. And in their place are the more subtle constellations of spring. Mm. I think probably the most recognisable springtime constellations early for me uh, is Leo the Lion. And again, it's one of those constellations that does look like what it's supposed to be. It kind of does look like a lion sitting in profile. Um, its brightest star is Regulus, uh, and it represents uh, essentially a big cat, a lion. Um, but I don't know. I think if you imagine it, you can see the lion shape, or at least, at the very least, a domestic house cat sitting down. But really? uh, maybe you don't see that. No, it's, to me, it's more <laughs> like a sphinx. Yeah, it's that sort of thing. But it does look like what it's supposed to, to look like. And Regulus, its brightest star, uh, is actually fairly easy to, to, to find. Yeah, well, one way to find it is to locate the, the plough or saucepan, which is very recognisable. Um, and it's overhead late evening. It sort of comes up on the northeast part of the sky and heads overhead. Um, but if you extend the pointers, those are the two stars furthest from the handle in the saucepan, um, if you um, point them up with respect to where the pan would be if it was sitting on a surface, if that makes any sense, that's more or less over towards the left or down when it's directly overhead, um, that points at Polaris. Uh, but if you extend them in the opposite direction, with a little bit of artistic license, they can work as reverse pointers and um, they will point at Regulus. Yes, and regularly you, you can you can tell when you found it because it marks the punctuation dot of a sort of backward question mark asterism oh, yes. that we call the sickle of Leo. Uh, I think it probably looks more like a question mark than a sickle, and that represents the head of the lion. Um, the rectangular body extends to the east of the sickle, and eventually ending in a pointed triangle representing the lion's tail. Um, the middle bright star, the end of the tail, is Denebola, which is Beta Leonis. And this is an interesting star because it has a rapid rotational rate. Its speed is 128 kilometers a second. So that's quite a high velocity, and it means the star probably bulges out at the equator. Yeah, I think it's actually getting close to the point where it would break up um, at that speed. So um, it is a very fast rotator. The sun is, is pretty leisurely. The sun goes around very very slowly um, compared to most other stars um, but of course it's also worth mentioning that Vesta which we mentioned just now is at opposition in Leo it's actually towards the um, the rear of the creature if you're looking for it so if you've got a good dark sky sight it may be worth having a look inside the magazine where there's a guide on 
um, giving you a challenge to try and locate Vesta by picking out some of the stars which are getting closer and closer to its brightness. It is quite a tall order uh, to ask you to see it with a naked eye, but it's worth having a go. There's another thing to tick off if you can, can, can pick it out. Yes. Okay, well, draw a line between Regulus, the brightest star in Leo, and Castor, which is the northern twin star, um, and locate the, li- the midpoint of that line. And if you've got really good dark skies, it's possible to see a misty patch there, which is, of course, the Beehive Cluster, Messier 44. That's quite an impressive cluster, isn't it? It is, and it does look like a little beehive, uh, uh, although there's no chance of confusing it with a comet, so I don't really know why it's, <laughs> why it's on Messier's list. Charles Messier added it to his cometry catalogue. Yes, list. but uh, it, is a lovely, it is a lovely open cluster and does kind of have a beehive shape, so warrants the name. Um, it sits at the centre, as you say, of this inverted Y-shaped constellation, which is Cancer the Crab. Um, although none of the stars in ca- the constellation of Cancer are particularly bright, uh, but it is visible from towns and cities, and uh, I think it is fairly distinctive as a constellation. Do you think so? It's Yeah, it's Acubans is the bright... Uh, well, I was going to say it's the brightest. I, I don't think it is the brightest star. I think uh, Beta... Can cry, which is called Altaf. Uh, that's the brighter one of, um, or the brightest one in Cancer. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed up constellation, but it's worth mentioning that just to the west of um, Acubans, there's another Messier cluster, M67. And I like that. It's a very rich cluster. It's much dimmer than the Beehive, but it is compact and very, very, very rich in stars. Yes, I actually have never seen it. Really? Uh, no, okay. I'd say yes, I should I should make more of an effort and take a look at it. Uh, but it's like a lot of these objects. Uh, uh, open clusters, I find, are often best seen with uh, small telescopes. So uh, it would mean of setting up a second telescope and going have a look, because uh, even in a medium-sized telescope, a lot of these star clusters are sort of, they fall outside the field of view. So. I think you'd be surprised with M67. I think you need to make the effort. I shall make look the at effort. It, even with a bigger telescope, um, especially as it's estimated to be of similar age to the solar system, and many of its stars have similar chemical properties to our own sun and for a while it was thought that the sun might have actually been born in m67 and been ejected into space and uh, but it's now thought that's unlikely but it's a nice a nice thought nice cluster nice cluster to look for all right well immediately south of cancer we have a, a lovely sideways sort of teardrop pattern which represents the head of hydra the water snake um the largest constellation by area in the entire sky what a pity that there are no <laughs> bright stars it's, in it I to mean, identify I mean, the, bright, the brightest star is um <laughs> alphard uh, which means yeah. the solitary one in fact if you've got that it's interesting that teardrop shape um sort of points to the east and then if you follow the line of that and imagine it as a curving neck down to Alfarb, which isn't too far down to the south and slightly to the east of the teardrop. Um, it looks a bit like that classic photograph of Nessie, you know, the surgeon's photo. Oh, where, yes, where the, yes. It, it looks like somebody's arm coming out of the lake, which is probably what it was. Uh, no, it, it was a fake, wasn't it? It was, it was a admitted, fake. Of course it was yeah. a fake, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course it was a fake. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it does look a little bit like that. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it, is a, it, is a, it is worth trying to look for it if you can find it. You probably do need uh, darker skies, though, to be able to see many of the stars in it. You do. And it does carry a number of interesting constellations on its back, which will reveal themselves as the, uh, as the weeks pass. Um, but you've got sextons, the sextant, which is very difficult to identify it's just a couple of really faint stars um crater the cup is faint but it it is a decent pattern it does look a bit like a cup sideways view of a cup Um, but the best one is corvus the crow which is a small but it's actually quite a bright constellation yes um, with with a nice quadrilateral there which is an asterism known as the sail because it's supposed to represent the sail of an ancient sailing boat (laughs) drifting along the horizon Right. Again, uh, you probably all need dark skies and a low horizon. And a good imagination. And a, and a decent amount of imagination to see <laughs> that. Well, plenty to see in the March night skies, so I wish everybody clear nights for it. Uh, thanks, Pete. Thank you, Paul.